Mr. Imaging channel, and I believe it's working tonight. Um, the um, I just wanted to go through some of the things that are upcoming over the next little bit, except that I've got I got to mute myself. Um, okay, um, we messed up pretty good last week with Ray, but he's a really good guy and uh, really helpful, and he's promised to come back, and uh, we've got him scheduled. I'll tell you about that in a minute. So Ray will be back with PEMPRO. Uh, Michaela is going to be here tonight. And she's going to tell us about astroimaging on the cheap um, and uh, how college students manage to get their astroimaging done. Ryan Blankenship will be here next week. He's going to uh, tell us about Pole Master and PhD2 and how to do some polar aligning. The week after that, we've got a new presenter to the Astro Imaging Channel, Danny Perry. He's from California Stars uh, website. Uh, Danny is part of the Riverside Astronomical Society, and I've imaged with him many times. And he has a lot of good things to tell us about. He hasn't decided whether he'll be which of the shows that he'll be doing. He's got a couple of them that he could be doing, um, and uh, so he'll he'll be here and and with us and on the 24th ron brecher will be here the next weekend on the 31st he's going to be telling us about some pixel math stuff and um, some advanced pixel math in pix insight the next weekend we're not going to be available to make a show because we're going to try to all go to new york I don't know if all of us are going to get there, but Togo will be there. I'll be there. And uh, so we're going to be at Neef. And so we won't be able to have a show on the 7th. Uh, Ray Graylick is coming back on the 14th of April to tell us about some PEMPRO stuff and all that other stuff. And by the way, Judy returns. She's my wife. I'm reading my calendar here. And Judy returns from Ohio that weekend. Um, on the 21st, uh, Bob Denny is going to be here. He's going to tell us about some of the developments in his program that he's working with. Um, Tom Bush is going to be here um, the week after that, and he's going to be telling us about um, high-resolution um, planetary imaging. The weekend after that, Charles Bracken will be here. He's going to talk about um, um, how to pick out a target for tonight. You know, what target should I image tonight? He's going to be telling us about some of the things you need to do when you're considering that. And um, the week after that is Amy and Justin's reception. My nephew is getting married, but that's not anything to do with you guys. I'm going to turn it over to Molly. Molly's going to introduce us to um, um, Michaela and take it from here. So Molly, go ahead. Hello, all. I've uh, brought my uh, my minion, Michaela, onto the show for this week. Uh, she is in my astronomy club, and we've been learning astrophotography together, which has been a really good time. She is a sophomore at Ohio State and is uh, majoring in physics, which makes me really happy because I also majored in physics. And uh, she's doing very well. And she's going to talk tonight about astrophotography, on a budget since she is a poor college student but still wants to do astrophotography i think some of her uh some of her skills and and the hacks that she's come up with can help uh, anybody who wants to get started in astrophotography but doesn't want to invest a whole lot of money in it yet figure out the best way to do that so uh michaela take it away okay am i coming through yep okay um hi everyone um, before I get started, I just want to apologize because I got sick this past week. So I'm sorry if I sniffle or cough or breathe deeply throughout my talk. I've been having a hard time catching my breath today, especially. Um, also, I tend to talk kind of fast, especially when I'm nervous, which I am. So if I start talking too quickly, please let me know. And questions are always welcome, too. I will also be under the impression that you are new or looking into astrophotography as well. All right, so let's dive into it. Um, where am I at? First off, I just want to start off by telling a bit about what I'm going to be talking about tonight. I will be speaking about my story and experience with astrophotography, while also specifically highlighting the financial struggles that I have faced being a college student now and a high school student when I first started out with astrophotography. Okay, now a bit about myself. Um, my name is Michaela Weller. I'm 19 years old and a sophomore at Ohio State University, majoring in, as you can probably guess, astronomy and astrophysics. 
Um, I don't know what I want to do with my career in astrophysics yet, but I have some sort of an, of an idea. I'm leaning towards astroparticle physics and namely the antimatter imbalance, but that's a whole different subject for a different day. Um, I got involved in astronomy in eighth grade when I was about 12 years old. My science teacher did a unit over astronomy, and ever since then, I've wanted to have a career in astrophysics. So in trying to work my way into the astronomy community, I joined my local astronomy club in July of 2015 when I was about 15 years old, but a few months shy of 16. And this was one of the best decisions I have ever made. The people in the club have been beyond helpful, and Molly has actually mentored me a lot. Um, I've had tons of problems, and she's been there every single step of the way. Um, but everyone in the club has chipped in and helping me learn everything about astronomy. And they've been kind enough to actually give me equipment that they don't use. And it helps out a lot because most of the time, I'd have to wait until I saved up money to get another piece of equipment, which could take months sometimes. And some of my best friends are actually in the club. So I highly, highly, highly recommend joining your local astronomy club, even if it's just a hobby or a slight interest for you. And this is how I actually got introduced to astrophotography, but I'll talk a bit about that one later. Um, and this picture of me is actually taken by Molly at the Green Bank Star Quest in 2017. And you can see the radio telescope in the background. Um, now to the money part. I got my first job at my family's business when I was a freshman in high school, so I've been working for quite a while. However, my first few years, I didn't work that much due to soccer and school and a few other things, but at that age, the money I did get was spent fairly fast on a variety of different things that probably I shouldn't have bought. I got hired and was paid minimum wage, and I believe at the time it was $7.95. Um, I'm not allowed to discuss my pay, especially because I'm sure some of my coworkers and friends will watch this, but I will say that I get slightly above minimum wage now. It's still not a lot of money by any means, but it's working. And despite this, I only work during the summer because of school. So all of my money for the year typically comes between the months of May and August. Um, the hours are all right, but I have to adhere to their policy. So if it's not busy, you'll get sent home and you can't do anything about it. But sometimes that can be a good blessing too. <laughs> Overall, it's a great job to have while in college and it has funded my astrophotography adventures thus far because I'm not talented enough like some people to create my own optics or mount because I don't know that stuff very well. Now, my first telescope was a birthday present from my parents in 2013 when I was turning 14 years old. Um, as you can see, this obviously isn't motorized, but I didn't even know motorized telescopes existed at the time, but I was still so excited to actually have a telescope. I took it out a few nights later, probably the next clear night, because Ohio doesn't get many, so it was probably a month later maybe, and I tried to find the Ring Nebula. And this was like a hard target, but it was on a star hopping book that the telescope came with. And the long story short is it was crazy hard, but like I said, it was a difficult object to find. Um, I don't think I ever found it that night because I was always under the impression that you'd be able to see what you see in the pictures from Hubble, for example. And as I would find out, it's far from the truth. So obviously I was disappointed, but I didn't give up on my love for astronomy. Um, between the scope and my next one was when I joined my astronomy club. I saw all different types of scopes and many photos of nebulae, galaxies, a lot of different things. And as I would find out later, these pictures were actually taken by club members. We have a professional astrophotographer in my club, and a lot of his work is posted around our observatory. So I would look at those, and I just I wanted to do that. So when I found that out, I was hooked. I wanted to do astrophotography astrophotography badly and I tried a few different things with my phone but I wasn't getting the results that I wanted so um, between my next scope I mostly used my astronomy clubs assets for a while when I was luckily luckily I caught this image 
I think I was using the Malin cam. I didn't take good data back then because I didn't know I was supposed to until I talked to Molly about it. Um, someone in my club was actually helping me do this. We were testing out the Malin cam on my um, on one of the club's scopes, and we were taking a video of the moon. And I was lucky enough that a plane flew through the frame. So we have a whole, I forget what they're called, GIF of it. But this is just a still image. Um, and this is another benefit of joining an astronomy club. They have tons of assets you can use that you probably can't afford. Or you want to know what you want to get. So um, assets are really good for an astronomy club. And so about a year later, I believe... I was given my second telescope, which wasn't good for astrophotography, which I would discuss later of why the scope wasn't good for astrophotography, but it's great for observational astronomy. Um, I still love the scope. I still have it. I still have all of my telescopes. I just can't get rid of them for some reason. Um, but it was a Christmas gift about three years ago from my parents. It was motorized but was an alt as mount. For those who don't know, an alt as mount is good for beginners. It allows to move the optics in altitude, which is up and down, and azimuth, which is side to side. However, I would learn that you can't really do astrophotography with this. Um, I know you can get a wedge for them, but I didn't want to go down that route, so I didn't. Um, uh, in talking with people in the club, you really need an equatorial mount because these are aligned to the celestial pole and tracked using right ascension and declination. And they allow for heavier equipment, like using, you can use a counterweight so you can have heavier OTAs and you can have the ability to guide. And guiding is extremely, it's useful and important because without it, you're limited to very short subframes or else the stars will appear elongated due to mechanical imperfections within the mount. Auto guiding applies small corrections to the mount that allows for long exposure imaging. In short, the guide star is followed throughout the exposure, and so when the star moves slightly because of the errors in the mount, a corrective signal is sent to move the star back into its position. I use PHD for guiding. It's a free software, so obviously it's good for me, and it works amazingly. It gets the job done. So knowing this information, I went out on the hunt for a good equatorial mount. I was recommended to get a Celestron Advanced VX, by the professional astrophotographer in my club. He has, I think he said he has two of them, and he said that they work really well, and they're relatively cheap for an equatorial, and it works amazingly. Um, so I knew I wanted to get an advanced VX mount. I think that's, yeah, right here. Um, it typically sells for about $800, but someone else in my club was selling his and he barely used it, and it was for $500. So I jumped on the offer. Um, $500 was a lot of money for me at the time, especially because I think I only had about 1000 saved up for my job when I bought it. I think I bought it about two years ago, maybe three or four. I don't really remember when I bought it. But it was definitely the first major cost for me. But it's a good mount. I still use it to this day. Um, Molly actually used it in Texas at the star party about in 2017, I think. And she actually bought one because she liked it so much. It's portable, it's lightweight, and it works great. Um, so like I said, I still use it to this day. I've had it for a couple years and I don't think I've had a single problem with it. I know Molly has, but I think that's just because she's unlucky with telescopes sometimes. <laughs> um, so now at this point, I have an equatorial mount with the Newtonian optical tube, which was the one from the Celestron 130 SLT. And the professional astrophotographer in the club also gave me a ZWO ASI 120mm. And later I would use this as a guide camera, but I, but I wanted to try to image with it first because it was my first real camera that I got. Um, it's about $140, but like I said, it was given to me by a club member. So luckily I got it for free, which is awesome. Um, so on these images, I actually had to use a bottle, a water bottle. I think I had to use two water bottles for counterweights because I, 
I don't think I had a counterweight actually. I'm not sure. And I also wasn't guiding, but I got these two images. This one's of the Ring Nebula, it's M57. And this one is the Dumbbell Nebula, and it's M27. And I know these images aren't good at all, but it was exciting for me at the time because it was like the first real images that I've gotten. Um, but I mean, these still weren't the results that I wanted to get. So my next purchase would be a DSLR. I went over to Molly's house one night and I think she was teaching me stuff about Deep Sky Stacker. And we searched for cameras and the accessories that you would need to get. And I ended up getting a Nikon D3200. And so I had to get stuff like a T-ring to be able to attach it to my telescope and everything. And I think this totaled to about $300, maybe $350. Um, so I, I had gathered a bit more money, but obviously still didn't have that much at the time. And so I was really quickly learning that astrophotography was an expensive hobby. Um, deep sky that is, because I'll be talking on some cheaper options for astrophotography towards the end of my talk. Um, so at this point in my adventures, I was running into a lot of problems. I could get my camera to attach to my Newtonian, but it wouldn't focus. And this turned out to be not enough back focus, but it was trial and error for a while. I bought a lot of things trying to resolve this issue and none of them fixed the problem. I remember one thing for sure I bought was a extension tube, but that made the problem even worse. And it was really disheartening because I really wanted to get images, but they just weren't focusing. So um, I bought, a, like I said, I bought a lot of things, but none of them fixed the problem. And I even had one of my club members try to physically move the mirror up, but it still didn't give enough focus so I could use the camera. And then one time I tried one of my club's Barlows. I believe it was a two times Barlow, and eventually I could get it to focus. But without guiding and using the Barlow, imaging was practically impossible or at the very least impractical. I didn't image for months because of the equipment issues. And like I said, during this time, I let Mar Molly borrow my AVX and camera for her trip to Texas, which would turn into a, another equipment issue with the camera. She took some dark frames, and dark frames will be explained later on during the post-processing -process portion. And she informed me that my camera was extremely noisy. These aren't my images, but you can kind of get the idea. Um, all these, like dots aren't supposed to be there and mine was full of them like it was the frame actually looked red which isn't good so I had to start looking to buy a new camera and it was actually a few months later when we were going to Green Bank West Virginia that I bought it and I bought a where'd it go I bought a new DSLR I bought the D5300 and I think that's the one Molly uses sometimes, too. And I was using Molly's Orion Short Tube 80. And my parents would actually end up buying this for $50 for my birthday a few, a few years later. Um, I didn't look up to see how much it sells unused. But I don't think I think it's less than $100. It's not an Apo. So you'll see in my later images that um, the purple cues around the stars. <laughs> And so, like I said, Molly and I were gearing up for a trip to Green Bank, and I wanted the ability to guide. So I bought this guide scope. It's the Orion 50 millimeter mini guide scope. Um, I bought an intervalometer because I couldn't afford background Nikon to be able to control the camera or anything, and a few other things. And that was about $110. So, so far, I probably spent about $800 in astrophotography, maybe a little bit more. Luckily, I already had a laptop from years ago so I didn't have to purchase a new one for astrophotography. photography but this laptop did actually recently break but luckily one of my club members could fix it and so that's good because that saved me about three hundred dollars which I don't have right now um so I've been sticking with this setup ever since Green Bank um I never solved the Newtonian issue I just stopped using it really um the setup that I've been using with the short tube 80 it works, and I love the images I get out with it, but like I said, it's not an apple, so all of my stars appear a purplish hue. 
but I have had the opportunity recently to use other club members equipment. One that I've been using is an 80 millimeter Explore Scientific Apo and the other is an awesome Stellarview 80 millimeter Apo. These are amazing scopes and I'm lucky to be in such an awesome club with cool people who will let me borrow their equipment. Um, an Apo refractor solves the chromatic aberration so that's why they cost more which is the reason why I don't have one and I believe that you can get rid of these purple halos and post-processing but I'll talk about that later that I don't have enough money to get good software to be able to get rid of those um, so now I'll get into the good stuff some of my images that I've taken and these are some of my favorites because I've taken a few that I'm not exactly happy with but these are definitely my favorites. Um, all of the images minus one have been taken with a Celestial Advanced VX, some sort of refractor combination, my Nikon D5300, the ZW ASI 120mm as the guide camera, and the Orion 50mm mini guide scope. So the first one is an image of the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, I took this in Green Bank, West Virginia at the StarQuest in 2017 with the Orion Short Tube 80. And you can see the purple hues around all the stars. I still love the image, but I would prefer those to go away. Um, this specific image is 21 frames that are five minutes long at ISO 1600. And I keep all of my images at this ISO because the astrophotographer in my club said it looks better for when you print your images. Um, the second one is one of the North America Nebula. I also took this one in Green Bank, West Virginia, the StarQuest, also with the short tube 80. And the frames are five minutes long. I can't remember how many I took, but it's at the same ISO 1600. Um, the third picture is one of the Tripid and Lagoon Nebula. Um, I don't think I could take flats with the scope, so that's why the edges look distorted like that. Um, this, I actually took this one with the Explore Scientific 80 millimeter ED triplet refractor. So that's why the, these stars don't really appear with the purplish hue. Um, this specific image was taken at my Astronomy Club's observatory and they were 20 by 300 seconds, which is five minutes. And the fourth one is the Heart Nebula. It was also taken at the observatory with the Explore Scientific, and it's only 11 subframes by 500 or 300 seconds, which is five minutes. And I believe Molly had to end up editing this for me with Pix Insight because I wasn't able to pull out the detail without making the whole image look reddish. Um, the fifth one is one of my all-time favorites. It's of the Snake Nebula, and I took it in Texas at the Star Party this past year with the Orion short tube 80. So once again, the purplish hues are popping up again. Um, but like I said, this is disheartening, but I just don't have enough money for a new Apple refractor. But I'm lucky enough to have club members that let me use theirs. Um, this one is, did I not put that in here? Yeah, it's 22 by five minute subframes. And like I took this, in Texas at the star party this past year. Um, the next one was actually an experiment experiment for me. Um, I wanted to try it. I read online and I thought I'd give it a try. And it's definitely a cheaper option for people who don't want to completely dive in. But I'll talk on this later. Um, it was of the recent lunar eclipse. I went out every five minutes. Well, I tried to at least because you can see this gap right here. Um, it was actually like 10 degrees Fahrenheit that night, so I was inside getting warmed up, and that's what that gap is for. But you can see the different phases of the moon as it slowly gets redder and redder and redder, and this was at totality right there. So um, later I put it into a free software. I'll mention the software later, and it made this composite image. Um, I was happy with it. It was something different and cool for me. And the last two are the same image and data set, but they're edited differently. And this will lead to my post-processing portion of my talk. The first edit is of the Rosette, of the Rosette Nebula. And this one was actually done by Molly with Pixinsight. 
which is expensive right now for me at least. I love how it turned out. I mean, your images can always be better, but I love this one. Um, it's really, it's kind of a true color. It looks a little bit pinkish. Molly actually has a really, really beautiful image of this. She actually won second place in the OPT Imaging Award, which is amazing. Um, and so the final picture is one that I actually did using all free software. It's not true color, um, but both of these images were taken at the observatory, and these were only 12 by 300 second subframes. So it's just amazing how different two images can be just based on the software and the creative eye of the person editing it. But this one's false color because I don't think there's any blue in the Rosette Nebula, but I just like the way it looks, so I kept it that way. <laughs> um, so now moving forward in my astrophotography adventures, I want to get a new OTA, which is an optical tube assembly, that will allow me to image smaller objects, because right now with the refractors, I'm limited to wide field, Due to my refractors, like I said, um, I've still never gotten my Newtonian to work, but I really do want a Newtonian because I love the diffraction spikes, even though it's actually an error with the optics, but I love them. So I really want a Newtonian, that uh, an astrograph, so I'll be able to actually image with it. And then after that, I'll be able to afford better cameras, better software. Um, I also do want to get a better guide scope and other things that just pop up here and there. Um, but that's far into the future, because right now I'm actually looking into purchasing a car, and those are extremely expensive. So that's what I'm doing now. So then now we're going to get into post-processing. Um, in the beginning, and still, I've been using all free software. I don't have the money to be able to put towards good software, especially because I'm not very good at editing still. I just can't ever get the color balances to work out. I'm always texting Molly while I'm editing and asking her like, what do I do? Um, these obviously won't be as good as your paid softwares like Photoshop or PixInsight. Um, but one day I hope I will be able to afford these and, better, and get better at editing. And then for stacking, I believe most people do use Deep Sky Stacker. That looks really blurry, and I don't know why. Um, it's free. It's easy to use. All you have to do is put in your light frames and all of your calibration frames. And really quick, for those who don't know, you typically take three calibration frames. These are darks, biases, and flats. Darks are used to reduce the final noise in your image and improve your signal-to-noise ratio. It basically just helps to make a better high quality image with less noise and makes your data stand out more. You take these at the same temperature, same exposure time, and same ISO as your light frames. And your light frames are the one that you take of the object that you're Im imaging. But with the dark frames, all you have to do is just put the lens, lens cap on, or you could leave it on the telescope and just put the cover on, which a lot of the times I actually forget to take the cover off. So when I'm going to focus or something, I'm, I'm like, Molly, why can't I see any stars? It's really funny. But I do it once a month, probably. Well, once every time I go out, because I don't go out every month because it's Ohio, so there's a lot of clouds. Um, bias frames I use to reduce the readout signal from the camera sensor. Um, and these ones are taking, taken at the shortest exposure length. I believe mine is 1 over 4,000, and you take these at the same ISO. Um, I read online that the temperature doesn't really matter, but I always take these at the same temperature because they're quick and easy. So I just take them before I pack up and leave. Um, you typically want 15 or 20 of all of these calibration frames because um, Deep Sky Stacker makes a master flat, master bias frame, and all that stuff. But So the more is always better. But I typically try to take around 15, even though I usually don't get 15 darks. I usually probably only get 8 or so, which is really bad. So I want to try to get more darks and build up a dark library like Molly has. That's very useful. Um, flats are used for vignetting. 
Um, actually, the Stellar View that I've been using, I don't think I put a picture with the Stellar View up there, but the Stellar View that I've been using is very flat. So I haven't had to take flats for the Stellar View yet, but these are the same ISO as your lights. Temperature doesn't matter. Um, I usually typically take these in the day, so temperature doesn't really matter at all. Uh, but you want to have the same camera orientation. I actually use a Sharpie to mark the orientation, so I just have the same one each time. Um, I use a white t-shirt to take these and try to do them during the daylight. You point the telescope away from the sun, and then you take the frames. You kind of have to guess, and you look at the histogram. When the histogram's in the middle, you're good to go. And so you just take 15 or 20 of those, and then you're done. And then after all of these frames are put into DSS, you click go. There are some options, of course. I just go by what Molly tells me to put on it because I really don't know the software that well. Um, I'm hoping maybe after I graduate, I'll be able to put more time into learning what each option does, like your brain or something like that. And you just let it go after you click it. And then it will stack each image and everything. And then when your image comes out, you aren't done. Um, Molly used to, well, I kind of used to use DSS to do some editing, but I don't anymore. I'll tell you the program that I use later on. Um, mainly I use GIMP and not DSS, even though it does have some options, because GIMP has your levels, it has your curves, it has your saturation, saturation, and hues so you can be able to stretch the histogram which is all I really know how to do with editing right now and I'm still not even good at that it's really tricky for me um, but obviously stretching the histogram makes your image noisy so I use a free software called Noiseware to get rid of the noise and actually all of these programs were recommended to me by Molly um, and I think I don't think Noiseware is free but I think it has a light version, which is the one I use, which is free. And I only use one button, so it's not that big of a deal for me that I only use the light version. And most of the time when I'm editing, I just mess around. I stress the histogram. I ask Molly for tons and tons and tons of advice. She probably gets annoyed with me until I get an image that I'm happy with. Um, most of the time, I'll even ask her to um, do do edit it and pick some site for me because I I love how pretty the images can get when you get software like that but I'm sticking to free software right now um actually for the lunar eclipse image that I took I actually use this software it's called star stacks um it's completely free you can just I, I think you can just google all of these softwares and it should pop up to download them um this software was extremely easy you just drop in all the images you want to use and just click go. I don't think there's very many options. I don't remember, but it's mainly used for star trail images, but that's not what I wanted to use it for, but it still did what I wanted it to do with the eclipse image. Um, I'm so learning the whole astrophotography game. I'm enjoying every bit of it. I have a long way to go still, but I'm gonna stick to it. And so that's basically my story. I skipped over some parts. This has been over about two years or so, two or three, that I've been trying to do astrophotography. So it's taken me quite a while, but I've stuck to it. And now, ever since Green Bank, I've been able to get more images. So I'm mainly just learning how to edit it, edit nowadays. Um, so like I said, that's my story. But now I'm going to get into cheaper options for astrophotography. Because all you really need to do astrophotography is a tripod and a lens, obviously a camera too. I only have an 18 to 55 milliliter lens, which is actually what I use to get the lunar eclipse picture for. Um, I don't do much photography like this, so a lot of the images I'm going to show are Molly's because she gets going in Texas and then just sets other cameras up because she has like 5,000 cameras. Um, so since I only have an 18 to 55 milliliter lens, I don't do much photography like this because um, you really need like 200 millimeters or so. Um, lens aren't that expensive, but I could always use $100 somewhere else. 
Um, tripods aren't that expensive either. I have one that I bought at my astronomy club's convention for a hundred dollars for my binoculars. I got it from Overwork actually. Um, it was for a hundred dollars. It was a really good option, and it works with my DSLR too and my binoculars, which is the reason why I bought it was for my binoculars. Um, like I said, all of the following images are taken by Molly, and the first one is a simple shot of the Milky Way, which is the galaxy we live in, although I'm sure most of you guys knew that. Um, she was actually in Albuquerque, as you can see, in New Mexico. She was away from the light pollution, which is always amazing. Uh, she took it with her Nikon D3100, um, the same lens that I have, actually, the 18 to 55 millimeter lens, and she took it at 18 millimeters, and all she used was a tripod. Um, I love this image. It is so gorgeous. I really want to get into doing astrophotography like that. I think you can even see Rove Fuyuki over here, too. Um, so I do want to get more into astrophotography like this. Um, um, she didn't tell me the specific cost of these setups, but I'm just going to guesstimate probably around $500, which is including the camera, which is most of the purchase, um, lens, and a tripod. And the next one is also a Milky Way shot. I love this one, too. You can see Trippet and Lagoon over here. I just love being able to see the dust and everything that blocks the light. It's so cool. Um, she took this one with her D5300 Nikon. Um, she took it with a 55 to 200 millimeter lens at 55 millimeters in her Vixen Polar E. Um, now, a Vixen Polar E is a star tracker. It attaches to a standard camera tripod. It uses motors to track the motion of the stars, and this allows for longer exposures, but typically only at wider fields. Um, the Polar E costs about $400, but you can always find stuff for cheaper. Molly actually got hers at Alcon for $200, but it was a demo model. Um, I actually want to use this at Texas. Um, but adding the Polary to Molly's price, I say the setup is about $700, which is typically the cost for a mount or a good OTA. So you really are saving a lot of money. And you get beautiful images. They're really gorgeous. Um, so the third one is an image of the Orion constellation. I also love this image a lot. I love the spikes you get with that. Um, here's the Orion Nebula, the horse head and flame. So you can get a lot of data with these too. Um, there's other things too, but I'm not gonna name them. Molly took this with her D5300 Nikon, 55 to 200 millimeter lens at eight, 85 millimeters, also with the Vixen Polar E. So like I said, the $700 setup, and you get a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous image like this. Um, the fourth one is probably one of my favorites besides the rosette that Molly has taken. It's of the Pleiades, which is right here. I just love being able to see the wide field of it. It's so pretty. Um, she took this with her D5300, 55 to 200 millimeter lens at 55 millimeters with the Vixen Polar e again. And finally, she also has a star trail image from the Texas Star Party in 2017. Um, she took this one with her D3100 Nikon, 18 to 55 millimeter lens at 18 millimeters and a simple tripod. Um, this is probably the absolute cheapest option. I say around $400 to $500. Um, I could actually take an image like this. For me, it would probably be about $400, and that includes the camera, the tripod, and the lens. Because you can find free software, free software to be able to get this composited image. Um, so this is probably the absolute cheapest option. So you don't even have to use a DSL, DSLR specifically for astrophotography. Um, you can do tons of things. You can just take pictures with them. So they're really worth the price. And you can even do time lapses too. Um, one of my favorite time lapses is actually this one that Molly took of us when we were at the Green Bank Star Quest in 2017. And it's at, in, make sure you pay attention. I'm gonna play this. So make sure you pay attention to the giant radio telescope in the background over here because it does move. Um, so I'll go ahead and play this. Hopefully. 
Um, so yeah, you don't you can use a DSLR for a lot of different things. I really like time lapses. I haven't done one myself. I I really want to learn how to. Um, so I'll do that in the future as well. Um, so in summary, astrophotography it's a, it's it can be expensive, but there are definitely cheaper options, and it's definitely worth it if you do decide to do it. Um, there's definitely a learning curve to it, and I'm still constantly learning. Molly has taught me a lot. John, the astrophotographer in our club, has taught me a lot, and everyone in the club has actually taught me everything I know about the night sky as well. Um, so I think that's all I have for tonight. So I hope you enjoyed my talk, and thank you to the Astro Imaging channel for inviting me as well. There we go. Yeah. All right. That was really good, Michaela. Thank you. That was yeah. awesome. Um, I hope I yeah, talked it, <laughs> No, no, that was perfect. Yeah. I, that was a cool story about um, what you, you know, the struggles that you've been through with your gear, which uh, when I gave, when I gave my talk uh, early, uh, last year, um, a lot of people have had really similar experiences to gear struggles and um, uh, uh, yeah, and telescopes and focusing and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so uh, people love, I think, hearing those kinds of stories because they very much identify with the struggle. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely a struggle, but you just got to stick to it. And it's really fun. Yeah. And you've obviously persevered. And uh, that's, that's really what it's all about in astrophotography is that perseverance. Mm -hmm. And you said something about fixing your RA backlash in your... Yeah, I, I fixed that today, actually. So uh, that should hopefully take care of the last issue with... Well, okay, my deck axis is, is really tight for some reason, but I'm going to work on that <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm getting there. That mount's almost ready to go. Then I just got to work on the CGE Pro. Oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah, that one. <laughs> Michaela? Michaela, are you and Molly in the date club or up in Columbus? Mm. What club are you in? The Dayton one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was interesting. You know, one thing that I would give advice to is that um, the people who are getting into it is to use what you've got to the mm -hmm. fullest extent. Don't decide that, oh, this isn't as good as something else, so I better stop doing it you may not have that choice. You may not have the money. You may not be able to just go out and buy something new. So just keep using what you've got until you've really used it up as much as you can. Then it's time to maybe go get something yeah. else. Yeah, I'm not going to do – I think Molly wants to get into narrowband imaging or at least um, using a filter reel. And I'm just going to stick with the DSLR for – a couple more months and get more used to that and it's because i really do have to learn how to edit because molly knows how bad i am at it well so. i'm still using my dslr like even though i've got my yeah. uh, my zwo now i'm still using my dslr a lot because there's a lot you can do with it yeah there, there really is and i love your time lapses she takes the one like every time you go out to the observatory so it's really <laughs> cool okay. yes yeah go ahead 
I don't know that we got any other questions. We got a few people, you know, uh, saying they like your stuff and things like that, and commenting that they've had some shared experiences, pretty much like yours. Um, and we did have. Uh, we were trying to work through what uh, somebody posted. A um, Nicole posted a, a comment. Richard, pretty nice comment movie, but he's got these stars that are dancing around. Um, I think it's just an issue of, of before you make the movie, Nicole, um, register, run run everything through a registration program, so, and um, put those into the movie rather than what you you know you just put the raws into the um, into the movie run the registration program your registration will register on the stars and the uh, comet will do what it's supposed to do i think one th yeah. one thing uh one thing i've heard you say over and over which actually i really liked and i praise you on is you talked about who you liked whose images you liked and whose footsteps you're following and that's that's a very good advice because at the end of the day you're the only one who needs to like your pictures. Yeah. And if you like the other person's pictures and you follow their footsteps, you're probably going to get similar results. And that's a win-win situation because you're not here to please anybody else except yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was very no, nice. I love all these images. I love her images. I can see the Rosette one in her background. And <laughs> I love that one. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So... But yeah, one of my um, favorites is Nebula. I actually did take that one in Texas. I've been wanting to image that one for a while, but it's not really a good target for our location. Um, it's very light polluted. So Texas was my one opportunity and I took it and I love the image, even though it does have the purplish halos. Uh, the other thing I really liked was the club stuff. There's an awful lot of people have an awful lot of resources that they do not take advantage of. Yes, I adore my astronomy club. Every time we have a meeting or members' night, I'm so happy. I love my club. Okay. And it introduced me to Molly, and I love Molly. So. I love you, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, somebody asked if uh, what's the imaging like in the Grand Canyon. Um, depends on what you're doing in the Grand Canyon, where you are. The campgrounds are almost impossible because they're those lovely campgrounds that have trees. Uh, so you got to get someplace else. And uh, yes, it's very dark in the Grand Canyon. Um, so it's as, it's about as good as it gets. Um, curiously, it's not a good place for um, um, uh, uh, stars, starscapes where you're trying to uh, get pictures of the sky and the um, uh, surroundings because the surroundings are all like below you. And uh, you're, if you're on the South Rim, which is the more popular place, uh, it's hard to uh, get anything to the North really. Um, it's pretty far away and it's pretty dark over there. Um, so the, it doesn't generally light up. Um, if you're on the uh, North Rim looking south, you can get the good Southern Milky Way during the um, um, summer, but um, uh, it's basically going into a black hole, generally speaking. It just, the, the ground doesn't light up because it's down below so far. So, um, but it's, yes, it's a very, very dark place to take pictures. Um, find, a, find a place away from everybody else though. Uh, and South Rim at the Grand Canyon Star Party, uh, that's not exactly an astroimaging place. It's, um, it's one of the all-time great events, but it is an outreach event. It is not, um, uh, let, me, let me say it this way. People come to that and there are tour buses, there's a visitor center, you know, there's a lot of lights and they do as much as they can to control all that stuff. And it is, it's dark, it's beautiful. And the sky is very, very dark, but there's herds of people around. However, they go away after about 10 or 11 o'clock at night, 11, 12 o'clock maybe. And it gets better after that, I hear. So, um, it, but if you've never been to the South Rim of the Grand Canyon, go there. Just don't necessarily treat it as an astro-imaging opportunity um, until well after the crowds have gone, okay?
<laughs> Where are we? Oh, there's a cat. Hello, oh. kitty. <laughs> All right, getting silly, getting silly here. Okay, hey, I think that's it for the um, for the uh, Astro Imaging Channel this week. Michaela, thank you very much for being here. Uh, we got Ryan yeah, next week, I think. Me. Ryan uh, is going to tell us a little bit about um, Pole Master and PhD two, and I think we got everything, don't we, guys? Yeah, it's, remember, it's, it's 9.30 Eastern, and the fact that it's daylight savings time just means that it went to, um, you know, 9.30 daylight savings time in the United States, and it isn't necessarily in the rest of the world. It doesn't follow Ben Franklin's lead. But anyway, good night, everybody, and we're going to stop the broadcast as soon as I can find that button So I'm looking for the button. <coughs> Come on, Richard. Got it.